Hi everyone, I'm Chester, and today I'm going to talk to you about swarm robotics. Um, now, first off, let's have a prerequisite. Who am I? Why do I care about this subject? Etc. So I'm a fourth year computer science student at York, although if you're watching this any time later than a day after release, that will no longer be true. Apologies, that's what happens when you do a talk in week 10. Uh, and why do I care about swarm robotics? Well, I did a couple of things which got me interested in them. I did an internship for your robots, which if you're interested, you should probably inquire about. They have good money and interesting topics. Um, I also did a PhD application for a project in swarm robotics. Now that didn't really work out, but something else did. So don't worry about that. And it just got me interested in the topic. I enjoyed doing the lit review for that. And also just, I live in a house where swarm robotics get mentioned quite a bit, so I can't really avoid the topic. Um, and beyond that, robots are cute. Just look at this thing. Look at it. Look at it. Um, okay, so let's talk about what swarm robotics even are. Um, what, what do I mean when I say swarm robotics? Well, swarm robotics is a field in autonomous robotics where you have a bunch of very small robots who all work on one general task. It's inspired by the behavior of swarms, as you might imagine. That means insects, flocks of birds, that sort of thing. Um, and an important thing is that you do, do not have a centralized behavior. The behavior is all individual to the robot and they act upon what they see in their own from their own sensors they don't have a centralized controller now why is that really cool well the nice thing about the fact that these robots are each individually doing their own thing is that you get something called emergent behavior this is behavior that arises as a result of the interactions between robots but can be more powerful than the capability of the robot as an individual um, this allows us to interact with environments as a large scale, including some that aren't well known. If we wanted to explore a new surface without risking any humans, swarm robotics would be an ideal tool. Just generally useful for autonomous systems and also just several other properties that we'll explore later. So what does a robot swarm look like? I did go into this slightly, but let's go into more detail. So you have multiple robots, they're usually small, this one is quite large and yet it still fits into my hand. Uh, they have lots of sensors. So if you can see here, you've got, for example, uh, I believe these are time of flight sensors and you can have a camera, things like that. They have a way of sensing the environment that's around them. However, beyond this, they have relatively low computational power. This is one of the more powerful swarm, swarm robots out there because it has a Raspberry Pi on top of it. But even then it's, I believe, a Raspberry Pi Zero. Importantly, like I said, there is no centralized behavior. You don't have a control tower telling what, these robots what to do. They're each programmed individually to act upon their individual input, or perhaps communication with the robots that are immediately next to them, but they aren't controlled from a central place. Now, what does a robot swarm need to be to work properly? Well, first off, it needs to be flexible. It needs to be able to cope with a bunch of different environments, especially environments that we might not be aware of or know the properties of, and it needs to be able to cope with a bunch of different tasks. To have a robot, you want our, your robot swarm to be able to go out and look for food, for example, but you might want to be able to reprogram that robot swarm to later on map that area. You also want a robot swarm to be robust. So if you lose an individual, you want that swarm to still be able of operating, uh, capable of operating at the same level or at a slightly lower level than it was before. Again, this is important if you want to explore unknown environments. You don't know necessarily what will happen to your robot, but you don't want to lose the entire capability of the swarm. And finally, you need your robot swarm to be scalable. That means that it can work at many different sizes. I've even heard some arguments that a swarm of four robots is a proper swarm, as long as you could, in theory, add more robots to it. Now, what can you do with swarm robotics? Well, there are several different tasks. Um, 
a paper that I will link to at the end defines nine, although I will talk about one task which isn't properly described in that paper, so you'll see that it's not necessarily the be-all end-all of all swarm robotics tasks, but this paper defines these following tasks. Aggregation, flocking, foraging, object clustering and sorting, navigation, path formation, deployment, collaborative manipulation, and task allocation. Now, I won't go into all of these because I don't necessarily understand all of them myself, but I will go into more detail about a couple of them. First, foraging. Now, this was inspired by the behaviour of ant colonies, with several ants that go around and fetch food for their colony. Um, the official definition of it is finding scattered up items and bringing them back to a nest. As you can imagine, this is quite useful because it can be applied to a bunch of different things, such as hazardous waste material cleanup, search and rescue, and just generally anything that involves finding a bunch of things and bringing them back to one place. This is also what you could call almost the most basic swarm robotics task. If you look at anything that's trying to prove something about swarm robotics, it will usually use the foraging task because it's very well defined. We understand very well what you want to do, there are a bunch of algorithms that explain how to do it, etc. Now, another swarm robotics task that is interesting and also that I have worked on myself is task allocation. Now, this is exactly what it says on the tin. You've got a bunch of tasks, you've got a bunch of robots which act as processes that complete these tasks, and you want the tasks to be allocated in one way or another. Maybe you want to make sure that task A is completed before task B, but you want to make sure that there is a fairly equal number of task A's and task B's, so you don't want everything to complete task A, etc. Now, it's really interesting to have this be based on swarm robotics, because robots assign themselves based on their environment. And this can be done through a number of ways. For example, you can signal as part of the environment that there is a task to be done, and these tasks, these signals can be left by robots themselves. This is again based on the behaviour of certain social insects, such as ants, and can be used in different contexts, such as um, a, you can use it as just a scheduler if you know how to do it. I read a really interesting master's thesis, for example, that used these algorithms to allocate tasks on a chip. Um, so yeah, task allocation. Now, one thing that wasn't really discussed in the paper that I cited earlier is mapping. Now, there's been a talk on this on this channel, so I would advise you to go there if you're interested in this at all. But essentially, lots of small robots distributed in an area with sensors can be helpful for mapping. This is good when you're interacting with an unknown environment again, or even an environment that you don't necessarily want humans to go in. Essentially, you have a bunch of robots that can know their location and who can sense a short amount of environment around them, and if you aggregate that data you can have a usable map. Like I said, Jacob did a talk on this, go watch it, it goes into much more detail and makes much more sense than my short explanation. So, this is really cool, swarm robots are really cool. Why do we still need to be working on them? What's the catch, as it were? What, what are the problems that we are currently working on? Although I wouldn't say that lots of cool and interesting work to do is necessarily a catch. Well, the first problem with swarm robotics is that it's really, really hard to verify their behaviour. You might have guessed this because we've talked about emergent behaviours which you can't necessarily predict. Of course, when you can't predict a behaviour, it's really difficult to test that it's safe. This is problematic in critical systems, and as you may have noticed, critical systems is one of the places where you would want to apply swarm robotics. Now, we do have a couple of techniques for these, this, and I will go into them, because it's very important that we be able to verify the behaviour of swarm robotics. So, first I'll go over some formal verification, then I'll talk about testing, and then I'll talk about a technique called property-driven design. So, the most formal method of testing, uh, of verification, when you want to verify the behaviour of an object, is, pro uh, is model checking. Now, model checking in general is quite a wide field, so I'm going to focus on probabilistic model checking, because there are various reasons why that is the most useful one to apply here. Probabilistic model checking 
models every state that a system can achieve with transitions with probabilities between them. Now, when you apply that to a swarm robotic system, you have two ways of approaching that. First is micro probabilistic model checking. There, you model the transitions for every single robot. You model every interaction between them, you model everything. Unfortunately, that ends up with a massive state space. It, it gets ridiculously large, ridiculously fast, even with a small number of robots. And when you want to be able to test for a large swarm, which is where the most unpredictable behaviors appear, this becomes impossible. Fortunately, there is another way to do this, and it has been tested and has found that it has managed to verify previously unexpected behaviors. This is macro probabilistic model checking, and I'll link to a paper about it at the end. Here, you want to model the swarm as a whole, as a population model. You verify that certain behaviors emerge and that others don't, but you don't have to model every single robot. This also means that the state space size doesn't change much as the swarm size changes, which is very useful. Unfortunately, it's very hard to show that it is in fact correct because you have to assign probabilities to things and you have to do that at, to the swarm as a whole, which is rather complicated. Another way to approach this is via testing or simulation. So testing obviously is the most useful thing to do because to see how robots behave, just make them behave in a certain way. Um, Unfortunately, that's difficult to do at large scales because you want to be able to make sure that you get every single possible behavior, which means that you want to, and because this is non-deterministic, you want to be testing thousands of times. So not, while it is useful, it's not necessarily realistic. Thankfully, we do have tools to help with that, and the most important is simulation. There are a couple of simulators for swarm robotics. The big ones are Argos and Gazebo. I'll talk to you a bit more about Argos in a bit because I've worked on that one. And essentially, the nice thing about that is that it allows you to run the same experiment as many times as you want, so long as you have a new random seed. That way you can see that you can test the behavior a million times and see that this specific behavior that you don't want never emerges. And that gives you a lot more confidence than testing what has to be a much smaller number of times can happen. Um, I've included here just a, a graph that shows task allocation based on a project that I did. And as you can see, there's just various behavior that we're able to map using simulation. So what is Argos? Argos is a simulator for swarm robotics. And the interesting about thing about it is that it is based upon plugins, which means that you can have your Argos engine and you can have a bunch of different sensors and tools and things like that. And then you can plug in a new robot. And if the robot doesn't have the sensor that you don't want, you can remove that sensor. If you want to have an additional sensor, you can create that sensor that yourself and then have that as a different plugin, etc. And then you can create yourself controllers for robots and you can set up experiments in XML because in this world we live in what doesn't have too much XML in it. Um, so yeah, it's really cool. I really enjoyed working on it. And this is one of the many things that I will recommend you to look more into if you think that it's interesting at all. It's written in C++. You can do a bunch of different work depending on what you want to do in it. You can work with the sensors, you can create physics engines, etc. It was a lot of fun. So finally, I'm going to talk about property-driven design, which mostly just takes all the techniques that I've mentioned here and discusses them and talks about and tries to create a standard technique and standard approach to swarm robotics, which would hopefully be safe. Now, this is developed by Iridia. This is one of the labs that's strongly involved in creating Argos. They've also done some work with these little pipucks, which you can also, which some work has also been done in York with. So they're quite connected to this whole thing. Um, so Iridia defines four phases in their property driven design. First, you've got the design phase. That's when you decide what is it that you want these swarm robots to do? What are the controllers supposed to do? Then you model the swarm using the prism based macro modeling. Then you simulate it using Argos. And finally, you do actual physical testing because simulators can only be so good and only be so accurate to reality.
Now, another problem that we come across with um, Swarm Robotics is that they're difficult to program, as quite frankly are any embedded systems. You talk to an embedded programmer about Swarm Robotics and they'll come out with some nonsense like, oh yeah, no, we can't get the charge level unless the Swarm Robot is turned off, so we have to estimate what it is via some cursed integration system. And if you just want to be collecting some data in a weird environment, you don't want to deal with that. So there are a couple of things being worked on to make this simpler, especially for people who, again, don't necessarily want to be working with the actual hardware themselves. The first of these is ROS, which stands for Robot Op Operating System. It's an idea of having standard drivers for robotics hardware that are written in C and Python. That means that you can use the robots quite easily using these drivers instead of having to work with the individual specific hardware, which will probably have its own weird stuff for shits and giggles. Um, the second one of these is more for writing controllers for these robots. So this is to define the behavior of each individual robot in the swarm. Um, it's called RoboChart and it's being worked on in York and it's really interesting. It's this chart-based chart notation to describe swarm robotics controllers and then it can generate code for these controllers. Once again, I strongly advise you to go speak to the people who I'll mention at the end and if you're interested in this at all. Finally, another problem with swarm robotics is the expense. An epoch is about 700 pounds. That's an epoch being the bottom of this. The Pipoc board, which is the Raspberry Pi you stick on top of it, is a further 255 pounds. And that's just a single robot. A single robot costs about as much as we currently have as Hacksock. So thankfully, cheaper robot swarms exist. Um, the Kilobot, for example, is a thousand robot swarm um, which was developed by Harvard, but unfortunately they're a lot less powerful. Like I mentioned earlier, this is one of the more powerful robot swarms that there are. This is also part of why good simulators are useful. So it might be hard to get more than, say, 30 of these in a room to do experiments on, but if I write a simulator for Pipux, I can have a simulation which has a hundred or well, if I use a thousand robots, maybe I'll have to use something a lot more powerful than my laptop, but you get the gist of it. Um, and finally, I'd like to talk about briefly about the ethics of interacting with environments. Like I've mentioned a lot in this talk, one of the uses of swarm robotics is interacting with unknown environments. Now, this itself comes with a whole bunch of ethical problems. Basically, launching a bunch of human-made objects with pot potentially unknown behaviours into a potentially unknown environment is a massively ethically loaded situation. I don't really have the time to go into both the ethical conundrums that this would cause, as well as the general, well, what do we do to solve it? But generally, there's an argument for holding these robots to a much greater standard than just safe, which is why all this verification that I talked about earlier is crucial. So here's the bibliography, um, and I'll just talk a bit about it here. Um, as you can see, there's quite a lot of more academic works, so this is quite an academic field. However, there is still quite a lot of work being done practically. There's still a lot of programming stuff to be done in them. It's a really interesting field, and there's quite a lot of it being done right here at York. And I think that if you found this talk interesting at all, if you found any of the problems things, uh, to be things that you think would be fun to work with, there's probably someone at York who's working on it. So I would strongly encourage you to go talk to them. And hopefully this means that I will be forgiven for not doing a PhD in Swarm Robotics. Thank you. Um, just so you know, my slides and speaker notes are on my Runciman, as well as is some of the work that I've done on Pipux, um, so feel free to go check that out. I will now be in Discord to answer questions if you have any, so please come and approach me then. If you don't, then you can email me or you can, you can at me on Twitter and I'll try and help, and hopefully I'll have good answers to your questions. Thank you.